My name is Henry LaVonda Marsh III, and I was born in Richmond, Virginia, December 10, 1933. My father was Henry LaVonda Marsh Jr., and my mother was Lucy Phillips Marsh, and um, I was born in Richmond. And I was one of uh, four siblings, four children. Uh, I was the oldest male. I have two younger brothers and one older sister. Uh, my older sister and my youngest brother are deceased. Uh, of course, my mother and father are deceased. Uh, what were your siblings' names? Marion Juanita Marsh Jones. She married a Jones. And uh, I preached her eulogy uh, that summer. Mm -hmm. She died and I went down to El Paso, Texas and gave her eulogy. Uh, she was uh, a couple of years older than I. Uh, my youngest brother was uh, uh, Harold Milton Marsh and he was a lawyer here in the office and he was uh, shot down by a disgruntled client uh, four or five years ago. But he was a managing partner in the law firm at the time. And he was a substitute judge. Uh, my other brother is still alive. He's retired in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, and his son is working here as a lawyer, and my nephew. Um, so that's the rest of siblings on my, from my mother and my father. Now I have three children. The oldest is Nadine Marsh Carter. Uh, she was a lawyer, and now she work at, works for an adoption agency, Virginia Home Society. Uh, my middle child is a daughter, Sonia Craft, Sonia Marsh Craft. She lives in Charlotte, and she has um, raised uh, four grandchildren. Uh, I'm really too young to have four grandchildren, but <laughs> she did it. And, uh, my older daughter has two children, and then my youngest son is uh, Dwayne. He's uh, living in Oakland, California. So did he follow in your footsteps? No, I never encouraged him to. Um, I, um, he went to Yale and uh, got a uh, bachelor's degree, and then he went went to the University of California, Berkeley, and got a master's degree, and he's teaching, not teaching, he's uh, practicing in, in the planning field in Oakland. And uh, my oldest child was uh, went to law school, and she joined the firm for a while, but she loves kids, so she started working with kids, and she went to uh, uh, Virginia, society for abused children and she stayed there a year or two and then she was a Virginia Home Society. And my middle daughter uh, went into uh, pharmacy. She got a degree from the University of Richmond. Both of my daughters did. And she is raising a family primarily now. So that takes care of my children and my brothers and sisters, my parents. Let me go back to your parents. Mm -hmm. Were they also born in Richmond? No, my father was born in North Carolina, a place called <coughs> Waysboro. And uh, his father was, I guess, Henry L. Marsh, and he owned a whole lot of land down there. He was, uh, and I think, Either he had been a slave or he was the son of a slave. Uh, my mother was born and raised in Newport News. And uh, when my father went to Hampton University, he met her and they got married. And it was during the Depression, so he stopped school and came to Richmond and got a job to support his family. And that's why I happened to have been in Richmond. 
And so how long were you in Richmond? Because I knew that, know that you grew up at least for some years in Smithfield. Yeah, I was in Richmond five years when my mother died. And uh, my youngest brother was six months old. And I was five, my other brother was three, my sister was six. My father, being a widower, couldn't raise the children that age. So he uh, delegated responsibility for the three older ones to my aunt in Smithfield, Virginia, and an aunt and uncle. And then the youngest one he sent to another aunt in Newport News. So my mother's sisters raised us. Uh, Amy Palmer raised the three older ones, and Rebecca Pleasance raised my youngest brother for for five years. And then my father, when we were old enough, he reassembled his family back in Richmond. So the four of us uh, lived in Richmond. Now you've, you've spoken in the past about your experiences, especially with regards to segregated schools in Smithfield and walking to school and watching the buses go by right. of white students. And I was wondering, what other kinds of influences uh, were you around in Smithfield? What kind of environment did your aunt create for you? Actually, it was all of White County, which is about five or six miles from Smithfield, a place called Rescue in Carrollton. And uh, the school I attended was Moonfield Elementary School. It was a one-room school for all, all seven grades, about 80 students, one teacher, who commuted from Newport News every, every week. Um, from the weekend, she spent the weekend in Smithfield in our way. Uh, it was a exp interesting experience. I really didn't know anything about the white children because all of us, all the black children attended that one room school with uh, one teacher in seven grades. We had to leave home before six in the morning to get to school on time because we had to walk five miles or if the weather was not too bad, we could walk through a shortcut. It'd be three and a half miles to a dirt road, but if we went along the highway, it'd be five miles. And we had to leave, it would, it would be dusk when we got back home, and it was dawn when we left home. And we walked every day. And I, when I first started, I was five and a half years old. Uh, until I left, when I left, I was 11. And I found out later that the white children were going to Smithfield, Virginia, for a huge school with separate sections of a class for each group of students. And in other words, the fifth grade had two or three sections and that type of thing. So when when did you find out about this? Well, I, we would see the buses going by and we, you know, we talked about it. Uh, but um, eventually I knew that um, they were getting a more uh, intense education and we were getting. How did you feel about that? I thought that was the way things were. I mean, you know, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know enough to know that uh, it was uh, segregation per se. It was just, this is what expected. This is what I'm expected to, to receive. And as I got older and when I came to Richmond, uh, it was the first time I, I came to the fifth grade, I had there were two or three sections of the fifth grade. It was, it was a black school. It was a George Mason Elementary School. And when I got to the sixth grade, there were sixth grade there were two or three sections of that. So, but it still was a segregated school. But by that time, I learned about segregation. There was one set of schools for African Americans and one set of schools for whites. And where so, did you learn this? I just learned it because, uh, you know. Uh, when I came to Richmond, uh, I was the principal called me in and said, uh, you were skipped in Isle of Wight because you were smart, so you have a grade ahead of you. I was in the sixth L, but it was in January or February, so I was out of place because the sixth L had started back in September. So he said, you can go back and get it good or I can move you forward and you missed something. He said, so I think you ought to go back and get it good. Of course, I was young and 
naive. I said, it was right. He was right. I went back because I come from all white school. He realized I had some deficiencies. So and by doing that, they added, I caught the extra grade. They added the 12th grade. So it's by going back a half a year, I picked up another whole year, and which I needed. But um, well, how involved was your father in uh, pushing you on educationally? He didn't have to push us. I mean, it was, it was you know, it was understood that we should get all the education we could get. In fact, in the summers, he sent us to North Carolina where he was born. And because of the seasonal crops, uh, the young people went to school in the summer because they had to harvest the crops in the fall. So we went to summer school in the summers, for four or five summers, uh, which supplemented what we were getting in our white, which even though it was segregated and it wasn't the highest quality, it was supplementing what I was getting and it probably helped me in the long run. That plus the extra year I got, plus the extra half a year, by the principal telling me you want to get it good or you want to go ahead. And of course I was young and naive. I said I want to get it good so he moved me back. And that helped me in the long run. So would you say that that principal was perhaps one of the um Influences in your early oh yeah my, all, my, my teachers all of my teachers uh, uh, took an interest um, the one teacher I had in Alaway County uh, she took an interest uh, the way she managed seven grades was that she had the older students teaching the younger students and had the younger students so that she kept everybody busy when we weren't slipping out to play baseball or something she involved us which reinforced the lessons. And what was your favorite subject? English. I mean, you know, I like English, but... The I grammar like the, or the literature side? The literature side. And so did you have favorite authors in your early years? No, I read, I read uh, everything I could read. I, I read the Canterbury Tales, because they were a little spicy, you know. Uh, I read uh, Shakespeare, and... and um, I had an incident when I was in George Mason School. I had a, a teacher who taught me English literature. And she asked, she called on someone to give Mark Hansen a speech. And I volunteered. I think she jumped on me because I was always coming to her class late because I was editor of the school paper. And I spent more time with the journalism than I did with literature. So she said, Mr. Marsh, you don't like my class, you come in later every day, why don't you stand up and recite Mark Anthony's speech? I said, yes ma'am. And I stood up and recited the speech perfectly. She said, well, all right. She said, why don't you give Bruce No, oh, I said, do you want me to give Brutus a speech too? And she said, y yes. She was sort of offended. And I gave Brutus a speech and the class started laughing. And she never forgave me for being smart. In fact, I got, I think it's the only C I got in school. Was but that your intent? No, I, not necessarily, but I wanted to show her that I was getting my lessons. And uh, I, we weren't assigned Buddhist speech, but when I read one, I read the other one. And I had memorized both of them. So I recited the other one. And she thought I was a smart addict. Did you do that often, that you would memorize and go beyond what you were assigned? Yes, I was, um, I was working at night all the way through high school. I, I worked at a restaurant, I did some kind of work. So, uh, Was this a black owned or white owned restaurant? White owned restaurant. I, uh, I washed dishes at a restaurant. And uh, so when I got off at 12 o'clock. So if we had breaks between the meals, I would slip into the bathroom and start my homework, do my homework. But if I didn't finish it, I'd have to do it when I got home. But I would always do my homework. Uh, and I stay up when I got home. 
And so I was sometimes sleepy the next day in class. So the teachers thought that I was disregarding that class because I was sleepy. They would call on me and I would always give the answers because I'd done my homework. And someone thought I was being smart. So why were you working? To earn money. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of resources. My father was uh, working as a waiter. And uh, I worked from the day I was old enough to carry newspapers until my senior year of college. I was always working, usually in the evenings, when I, after I stopped carrying papers. And uh, What newspaper did you carry? Richmond Times Dispatch. Richmond News Leader, really, because I worked in the evenings. And uh, when I was living in the East End, I took a route of 78 and built it up to 115. I moved to the West End and took a route of 85 and built it up to 130, you know, by asking people to subscribe to the paper. And I remember one incident where uh, the manager asked me to make a spiel for soliciting for the paper, and I made my usual spiel. And I, t I talked about the advantages of subscribing to a weekly paper and you could find out because of the newspaper's association with the AP and the UP that you could find out what was going on the other side of the world the next day. And he was impressed. He said, well, you know, where did you learn that? I said, well, you know, it's the AP, you have it in your paper. And that's the way you find out, you know. And so, you know, he was very impressed about that. And so was, he was surprised that you actually read the paper you were delivering? That, that I knew the network for gathering news, and I used that to solicit customers for the paper. You know, and the, the other, apparently the other news persons didn't do that to solicit. So tell me a little bit about high school. Um, it was different from high school today. We had, uh, I was the president of the NACP, they had the NACP chapter in high school because it was segregated. So. In a black high school, you had an ACP chapter. Uh, or I was editor of the newspaper. I was active uh, vice president of my class. And in the student government, it was, I was not academically uh, uh, attuned as much as I was in extracurricular activities. All of my sisters and brothers made all A's all the way through elementary school and all the way through high school. I was uh, A minus, B plus to I graduated with honors, but I, I wasn't, I used to say I was the black sheep in the family because I wasn't as smart as the others. My brother, who's next to me, majored in analytical chemistry. Under the, the number one University of Minnesota, the number one analytical chemistry professor in the country. And he ended up inventing a battery that Google Battery Company used. And my sister was extremely smart. To, after finishing uh, Armstrong with all A's, she went to MCV, but she took a medical technology class because she could graduate and get a job in one year. And she did that, then she helped us coming behind her. And she told me that I had to work all the way through my senior year at Virginia Union. She said, I want you to perform one year where you don't have to work. And uh, that was the first time I'd ever been in school where I didn't have to work at night. And uh, Dr. Henderson, the president of Virginia Union, told me that in the beginning of the year that you, you went out for the tennis team and he said, you need to give that up because you want to go to law school. And you don't quite have a B average today. If you want to go to law school, you need to quit the tennis team and focus on your lessons. I said, well, I've never gotten a letter. This is my last chance to get a letter all the way through high school and all the way through college. And he says, I'm going to be on the tennis team. He said, well, which do you want most, to be a lawyer or to uh, be on the tennis team? I said, I want both. And he tried to talk me out of being on the tennis team. But uh, I persisted, and of course, I was determined then to show him that I made the right decision. I needed eight A's and four B's to graduate cum laude, and I got nine A's and three B's. Now, what, what precipitated the president of the school coming and talking that, to you about it? That's the way it was. They were interested in the students. And uh, just like the teachers at Maggie Walker uh, challenged me, because they were interested, uh, the president of uh, the union challenged me because 
And he was looking out for his students and he heard I want to be a lawyer. And he looked at my record and he said, well, you're not going to make it, you're not going to be accepted in the school if you don't graduate with honors. I said, what do I need to graduate with honors? He said, eight A's and four B's and no C's. I said, okay. But because my sister had relieved me of having to work in the evening, I was able to do that and get my tennis letter too. So what interested you in law? I had seen Mr. Hill and Spot Robinson, who Mr. Hill was later my partner, uh, argue a case, uh, one of the early aspects of the Brown v. Ward case. And How I, did you see the, the argument? I heard they were going to be in court, and, and I just went, you know, to observe. What made you do that? That's unusual. I was interested. I was curious, I guess. And uh, I went to hear them, and then later on, when I was in college, uh, the state of Virginia had a public hearing to on the massive resistance, and I read in a newspaper that they would have a public hearing, and I uh, attended the public hearing on behalf of the students of Virginia Union and spoke against the plan to maintain segregation. And Mr. Hill spoke at the same point. He spoke for the Virginia NACP. And when I finished, he came up and said, boy, that was a pretty good speech. What are you going to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be a lawyer like you. He said, well, I need help. Why don't you come on and join my firm? And I was a college student. So I said, sure. So we shook hands. I had a job as a lawyer while I was still in college. I had another year to go. And we kept in touch. And when I finished, I joined this firm, and we became partners. So what was it? in your speech that made Oliver Hill well, I was the only student for one thing. Uh, everyone else was an adult. Uh, they, they were mature, older people, and I spoke. Uh, what did you say? Can you remember? I, can rem I don't remember what I said, but I was, uh, I was telling them it was wrong to use public funds to maintain segregated schools. And the Supreme Court had ruled and you know you just define the law and it's not fair you know to the taxpayers it's not fair to anybody and i remember uh when mr hill spoke uh it was one of those memorable events because first time i'd ever been in a public thing to speak he uh he shook his fists at a joint session of the legislature and it frightened me because i never seen a black man standing in front of 140 white people, white males, all males, and lectured to them like he did. And when he slammed his fist like that, I ducked down. I said, uh-oh, <laughs> something's going to happen here. But uh, he made a tremendous speech. And um, What was the reaction? Oh, they listened intently. Mr. Hill was a powerful speaker. He was uh, tall, about six, 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 seven handsome man and he he was full of uh, anger and eloquence and he says if you do this we will beat you and I said oh gracious <laughs> what's going to happen here but I was impressed and um, the next day Dr. Anderson called me in and said uh, Henry uh, I see where you went down and testified yesterday General Simmons, I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you know, when you speak for a university, you need to get permission. You didn't get permission to go down. I said, oh, no, sir, I wasn't speaking for the university. I was speaking for the students. I'm president of student government, and that's what I was speaking for. And he smiled. He said, well, you know, you should still get permission. He said, now, it turns out that I got calls from some of our trustees this morning. And they were all very proud of the fact that one of their students had gone down to speak. And so they were very happy about that. said, but you still should have gotten permission. He said, uh, the next time you do something like that, you need to request permission. I said, well, Dr. Henderson, if I had asked you for permission to go down and speak, what would you have said? And it was silence. And he smiled. He said, well, I'll just ask for permission anyway. 
Now he knew and I knew that if I did it again, I wasn't going to ask for permission. Because <laughs> it, it would put him on the spot with the trustees, uh, you know, to condone somebody going to get in or what I was going to say. And the opposite, they would say no. So, you know, and he knew and I knew that he was wasting his time telling me that. But he, he really had my interest at heart and the school. The trustees were the ones who were donated money to keep the school running, so he was doing his job. And I was doing what I had to do. Tell me, what made you select Virginia Union versus the alma mater of your parents? I couldn't afford to go anywhere else. I mean, I, I could go to the Union at home. Uh, I could walk to school. Uh, you know, there were four of us. My father was raising four children by himself. And, uh, you know, he was, he was a waiter. He was waiting tables. And he, uh, he was providing for us, but uh, he couldn't afford to send us to uh, college. Uh, when my sister finished, and started working. She was able to help the brother next to me and my youngest brother go to college. But when I came along, uh, you know, I couldn't go to college. Plus, they got scholarships. They had um, straight A's. So my youngest brother got a scholarship to University of Virginia, and. Uh, the other brother got a scholarship to a school out in the Midwest. Uh, and to show you the impact of segregation, when Harold tried to go to Charlottesville, uh, they wouldn't admit him to the liberal arts. Uh, but engineering was considered a graduate school, so he, they told him if you start in the engineering, you get the same general program, and you can switch over to liberal arts before you finish. But when he finished the two-year program, they didn't switch him. He stayed, so he became an electrical engineer, although his, his uh, forte was uh, chemistry, math, and physics. But he, he graduated in engineering because the University of Virginia discouraged African Americans from coming to the undergraduate school. So with the physics, in math, he had, in engineering school, he was able to teach uh, at Virginia State. He taught physics for a year or so. And one year, while he was teaching, uh, I got some speeding tickets, and I had to stop driving for 60 days. So he drove me around to various courts, to uh, industrial commission hearings, workman's comp hearings, and course around the state and in watching me practice he decided that's what he wanted to do so even though he had his engineering degree he went back to law school and graduated University of Virginia Law School came back and joined the law firm mm -hmm. so he became a part of the firm and I think he was influenced by what I was doing and when he joined the firm I assigned him to work for a lawyer who was working here he said no I want to work with you that's why I went to school so you know, we worked together on things. And he they said he became the managing partner of my firm before he was killed by a client. And my daughter also uh, graduated from the University of Richmond. And she got a job with an insurance company. And she decided to go back to the University of Richmond Law School to get a law degree. And she joined the firm. And she and I actually tried cases together. And we won some jury verdicts and some appeals. And then when she started working, volunteering with the kids, she fell in love with kids. And she, she's always loved kids, but she told me one day she wanted to stop practicing law to join 
uh, this organization and charge taking care of abused kids. And so she did that. And then after doing that for a year or two, she moved over to adoption, still working with kids. So at one point, I almost had a family law firm because my nephew was working in the firm and my daughter was in the firm. I mean, yeah. What do you my think brother. has attracted so many of your family members to the field of law? Well, I think they were influenced by me. Initially, it was said my daughter didn't stay in law. She went back to her first of uh, kids. Uh, and my brother, he, he wasn't interested in engineering. He was steered into engineering and he got a job teaching, but I don't think his heart was really in that. It was just a job and then he decided to become a lawyer. Your, your career in law has been about advocacy for right. rights and so forth. And so it seems as if that has been your focus. Has, has that been, was that what got you interested in politics? Is this whole idea that it could be a vehicle for advocating for rights? Well, actually, it's my, it's my frustration with the law that, uh, and my frustration with the situation in Richmond that uh, caused me to go into politics. I, I, at the time I went, I ran for public office, I was the least likely person to run because I was suing everybody under the sun. I started a case in Norfolk in 1963, these irrigated schools, actually by myself, and I didn't finish that case until 1982. I litigated down there for 19 years before I finally got the school desegregated. And I was suing other places. I was suing Title VII cases. I even sued the state of Virginia for single member districts which uh, I now represent one of those districts that was created. But I saw a need for someone to run who was not a part of the uh, business community machine. So I started asking other people to run for office. And I couldn't get anybody to do it who was not a part. They had two African Americans who had been picked up by the business community. and they were making statements that I didn't agree with. Uh, so I said, we can't have these people as our only spokespersons. Uh, why don't you run? I went, ask different people. I don't have time, you do it. I want to make some money, you run, you know. So at the last minute before the deadline, I said, well, I'm going to have to run at least for two years to get somebody. It was two-year terms. And I said, I'll run for two years, and by the time I can find somebody, you know, it's part-time. So I ran. And after the first meeting, I saw how, I don't know how to put it, uh, how unskilled the people were down there. I said, I could do a better job than this. So I immediately started out working on a team for two years later that we would, I would have some influence to change things. So I, two years later, I ran a team of two whites and three, three whites and two blacks. And I was the head of the team to take over after two years while I was still litigating everywhere. And that two years turned into 25 before I left to go into the Senate. And the only reason I quit then was Governor Wilder called me over and asked me, to, why don't I want you to join the legislature? I said, well, I haven't finished. Oh, he said, you never finish over there. People don't appreciate what you're doing, working 52 weeks a year. Oh, here you work six weeks, eight weeks, and you can practice more. So eventually I did that. But uh, I had no intention of going into politics. But the law was so slow. Uh, the Brown case was decided in 1954. And we argued a case in 1966, 67 really, because the case was decided in 68, still trying to get the court to enforce desegregation. So I realized that the change by the law is very slow, but politically things were happening. And so we had to do both, and that's why I went into uh, politics. I'm going to follow up with a few questions about that in a minute. I want to go back, though, to your Howard Law School 
experiences. Of course, the school of Charles Houston, who set the bar for how African Americans would be trained as lawyers in that area. And I was wondering, what impact did that have on your future career, looking back? Quite a bit. It was the best thing that happened to me that I didn't go to the University of Virginia because the associations wouldn't have been the same. Uh, when I applied to the University of Virginia, I think I had to pay $200 or $250 to take a test to see if I had the skills to get into the school. $250 was a lot of money. And when I applied to Howard, they said, you admit it, uh, we have a scholarship for you. Uh, the state of Virginia has a grant that will pay you for not going to their schools. And if you need a job in the library, you know, we can help you. So I had a choice. I'm not, I wasn't sure I could get in, but I would blow $250 to find out. And I, what, what would I do after that? I just, you know, this was a, was a no-brainer. But by going to Howard, I was associated with other serious-minded people who, many of them were leaving successful careers to go to law school. And many of them had aspirations to change the system. So I was thrown into that environment which helped me, uh, I never would have gotten that at UVA. So you credit that really with this motivation that you've had all your career to? Well, not just that. I think uh, the, um, the fact that Howard was open to outstanding black students and the other schools weren't meant that Howard got a lot of the cream of the crop at that time because the other schools hadn't opened up. So I was thrown in with serious students who wanted to make a contribution who couldn't get into the, the white schools. So the at law school, the environment that you're in helps shape you because you're associating with other people. So I think Howard's uh, tendency to push for civil rights, the quality of the students who were my classmates, all of that fostered uh, interest. For example, they had the dry runs for the Supreme Court arguments at Howard. The cases they were arguing for the Supreme Court, they would come to Howard and these students could go and attend and see them practice their arguments. So that was, uh, it was fortunate that I couldn't go to UVA because uh, they said I wouldn't have gotten the same kind of experience. Later on it shifted because later on uh, the other students began taking the top students, so I was left with some good students, but some leftovers. So when you um, came back to Richmond, um, at what point did you take the bar exam after finishing? Well, I took the bar before I came back. I took the bar and passed the bar the first time, and uh, I went into the service uh, on active duty for six months to took care of my service obligation and I was waiting for Mr. Hill to call me back to my job that he had promised me earlier and he didn't have space he was in one room and he said as soon as I get space I'll send for you so when he got space he called me back but by that time he had helped Kennedy win and Kennedy offered him a position a full-time position so he had to lead a firm and he left it with me and Mr. Tucker his a lawyer from the employee who had worked with him before. That's how I ended up as a partner in a law firm starting off. So when you started off working in the law firm, what kinds of cases? Everything. We did everything. We, we took over the practice Mr. Hill had and we built to it, added on to it, but it was his practice. He had personal injury cases, criminal cases, represent insurance company, represent Virginia Union. You know, we, we, we had a general practice, and we still did civil rights cases. So now, these civil rights cases that um, were so important during this period, did you go out and solicit we, we didn't have to. The NACP uh, would refer cases to us. People would come to the NACP for assistance. Or some people, when they found out we had them, they would just come to us directly, and we didn't have to go out and solicit. Now, just in, in looking over some of the early cases, like the Prince Edward County 62 and 
uh, you were involved with the Portsmouth case in late 68, 69, and the Norfolk case and so forth. Of those cases, which ones were the most frustrating to you and why? And which ones were um, the most perhaps challenging or rewarding cases? Well, I don't think I was ever frustrated. I think Norfolk uh, took 19 years. We we would uh, lose the case before Judge Hoffman, and we would appeal, and they would send it back down for him to do the right thing, and we'd try it again on a remand. He'd rule against us, and we'd take it back up again. We'd win the case, and they'd send it back. And that kept on until one year. Uh, Nixon sent, the Justice Department sent Judge Hoffman out to Nevada to try a criminal case, and he wasn't there, so the case was assigned to Judge McKenzie. So we got each school integrated to the 58% white, 42% black. Each faculty that he gated got free transportation for the kids. And when Judge Hoffman came back, he called me into his chamber. He said, uh, we, we litigated each year for 19 years. He said, Mr. Marsh, you tricked me. That's the way he talked. You tricked me. I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, uh, you caught me out of town and you got these schools desegregated. I said, no, sir, I thought you were going to be here. I said, I didn't realize you weren't going to be here. I thought, sure, I had you. I said, that was, was my doing. And he said, well, you, you, you did it. It took a long time, but you did it. I said, well, yes, sir, well, you know, that, that's my job. And I think over the years he, he developed a respect for me, even though we were opponents. We were friendly opponents. Because uh, I would challenge him every step of the way. And uh, I sort of think he was paying back the community for ordering the African Americans in, a, in the 50s when the school desegregation first came. He ordered them to admit some black students in. There wasn't a whole lot of them, but he got criticized and socially ostracized, I guess, for that. So after he had earned his good points by doing that one deed, I think he took it on himself to make sure that he held the line. And yeah, after that, I was determined that the schools would be desegregated. So, so with the courts remanding the case back over and over and over again and Hoffman refusing to hear it or to no, he would hear it. He rule, against to me. rule against He'd rule you. against me. And, uh, I'd did, make a record. did he ever get any flack from the appeals court? Or? No, no, no. He, he ruled against me, and he got so interested that he would actually interrupt the uh, testimony of the superintendent. I'd have the superintendent on the stand, and when I got him in a corner where I had him, where I want him, just before I could make him admit the critical point, Judge Hoffman would take over the examination and ask leading questions. And I would object. He said, Mr. Marsh, I'm the judge. You can't object to my question. I said, yes, sir, you, you are taking on the role of the school board's attorney, and I can object to the question. And I objected. And we fussed and fussed, and by the time we got to fussing, he forgot what his point was. And uh, one time we were trying to nip on news case, and Mr. Tucker happened to be in court with me. And Judge Hoffman and I got in one of those arguments. And the judge said, Mr. Marsh, sit down. And I would sit down, and he would start again. I'd ease up on my seat and get his attention. And I'd stand up. He said, Mr. Marsh, sit down. He'd yell, you know. And I'd say, but y'all, sit down. I'd sit down. And by the time I got through agitating him, he didn't remember what he was asking. Because <laughs> he wasn't taking notes. He was just trying to stop me from getting the super superintendent. So you were so, doing that intentionally? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So Mr. Tucker told me later, I said, man, I thought you were going to jail. I said, I know how far, I know how far to go. I said, you know, we, we know each other. And, uh, you know, I learned how to s distract his attention. So did, I, he ever did he ever realize that's what you were doing? I think he did after the fact, but at the time he would get angry. And apparently some lawyers uh, would be intimidated by the judge and wouldn't Asked the question the judge wouldn't object to the judge's question. But I said, Your Honor, you can't tell the witness what to say. 
you putting the answer in his mouth. You, you, you can ask your questions, but you, I object to you giving him information, giving him the answers. You know, I put it all on the record. And, it, and one, one year I got him because he wouldn't let me present certain testimony. He said, well, you can make a proffer for the record. I said, yes, sir. So when he finished court, he adjourned the court and, and let me get to the court reporter. And I put all this stuff in the record as to what the witness would have said. And the court of appeals ate him up. So after that, he wouldn't let me make the profit anymore. I had to make the profit in open court because <laughs> I just dumped everything I could dump in the record. I said, if this witness had been permitted to testify, he would have said this and he would have said that. He would have said, I laid out my whole case. And so what do you think about this remaking of Hoffman's image? Because a lot of people with the upcoming 50th anniversary, a lot of people are hailing him as, as a, almost a civil rights hero. Oh, no, not a, because it, it, that one incident, and he was a great judge on other things, he was sought after all over the country for these complicated trials with these criminals and, and, and people who had uh, very complicated, he was a masterful judge. He had that one weakness. He was constantly trying to repay the Norfolk community for ordering those kids in school. And, uh, you know, Eventually, I won down in other jurisdictions. He would have to order desegregation in Newport News and in uh, uh, Isle of Wight, where I walked to school. Uh, he had that case. And I testified, I wasn't supposed to testify, about how I had to walk to school. And they said busing was bad. I said I would have loved to be on one of those buses when I was six years old walking to school at six o'clock in the morning while the white children were riding by on a warm, heated bus. And Judge Hoffman could identify with that, so he laid the school superintendent out. How dare you say busing is wrong when Mr. Marsh had to walk in the cold, you know? But when he got to Norfolk, he was protective. But Portsmouth, Chesapeake, all these other school districts down there, uh, Norfolk, I mean Sussex, uh, I sued everybody, all those jurisdictions. Roanoke, Lynchburg, Charlottesville, I sued everybody. I understand in the Portsmouth case, he got so frustrated with your objections to the freedom of choice yeah. issue that he told you to go ahead and write up your own plan. Yeah, we, he, 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 what happened was we would hire our own expert because the school board would have a plan and he permit us to have our own plan. Uh, I really think in these other jurisdictions, he was sort of going through the motions because I didn't have to appeal many of those cases. Uh, but Norfolk, he was determined to hold a line in Norfolk. And uh, did you ever figure out why, aside from oh yeah, I knew because I knew the history. I knew the history, but you know you can't talk about that. Uh, what happened was, you know, I just started practicing. It was 1963. I started practicing in May of 61. And we had cases all over the state. So Tucker said, well, Henry, you go to Norfolk. And, you know, I go out here to Northwest, you know. And Norfolk was a major case because it had a whole lot of students and it had a whole lot of African Americans and it had complicated problems of transportation. So I, that became a, a career thing for me. And uh, the case involved a whole lot of new theories, you know, uh, tipping point. Uh, the school board came with a theory that when blacks got to be a certain point, it would be the tipping point and whites would leave. And th they tried to say that you could keep the black percentage low but then you'd have some schools that would be almost all black. How, how could you justify who would go to those schools? I mean, it, it didn't make any sense. And they tried that, and they had experts to come in, and I had experts to come in to counter that. You know, it, it, it was very interesting. But those were the kind of challenges we had. Um, and in addition to practicing law, I was doing the political thing too, like. I went up to Congress to testify to get Virginia covered by the Voting Rights Act. The uh, Attorney General went up to say that Virginia shouldn't be on the act because 
it wasn't as bad as those other states, and it had not denied the voting rights of anyone. And uh, I went up to testify, and Mr. Tucker and Mr. Banks went, they went to the House, and uh, I went to the Senate. We split up, because both of them were having hearings. And in the morning, Attorney Frederick Gray, who was an acting Attorney General, testified before the Senate committee that Virginia hadn't violated any law. They shouldn't be covered by the act. So during the lunch break, uh, Senator Edward Kennedy, was, who was on the committee, he came through the hall. And I knew he was a, a ranking member of the committee, so I called him aside and showed him an order that we just gotten in Petersburg against blank registration. They would give a, a prospective voter a blank piece of paper and they had to memorize the 10 questions f to qualify in sequence and memorize the answers. So we sued and Judge Buster enjoined that. So I, and we got an order. So when I explained that to Mr. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, he said, thank you and I'll take care of this after lunch. Went back after lunch, he took that order and got the Attorney General back on the stand. He said, you said that Virginia had body in law, how do you explain this? And he tore him up, the committee ate him up alive. And Virginia was kept on the act, that was in 1965. And uh, because of that act, because I didn't run until 66, it opened the door for, oh, the poll tax also was a requirement unlawful. You had to pay three years if you, first time you voted African American, it was $5. So we kept Virginia on the act. And then I benefited from that in a way because when I ran for city council, the Voting Rights Act had passed. And blacks began to register and vote. So I was doing the political thing as well as the legal thing. So Did that ever put you in any kind of strange situation with some of these judges you were arguing before? No, I think they respected uh, what was going on. You know, they knew what was going on. You know. well, every now and then we'd run into a hostile judge, but you know, they couldn't turn back the tide of history. Mm -hmm. I, I want to kind of go back a little bit to Norfolk and that whole area since you had some <laughs> interesting situations there and you talked about this this long-standing fight that went on in Norfolk and I understand that you were involved um, through with the NAACP yeah. with the new Booker T Washington High School in that city and that created a lot of conflict within the community yeah I, I, same thing in, in, in Portsmouth Norcom was the uh, was a big battle the blacks didn't want to close Norcom and the blacks in Norfolk, some of them didn't want to integrate Booker T, Washington. So we had to deal with that. And uh, uh, that was an interesting aspect of the whole civil rights school desegregation struggle. Uh, the pride that blacks had in black schools versus the desire to have an integrated education. And there were some situations in Portsmouth where actually I had to speak to a mob of uh, angry black people who wanted to keep the segregated school. In Norfolk, I had to fight the same thing. But I went to the churches and worked with the church leadership and got by it okay. But it's a complicated issue more than we have time to go into right now. Because you had a, uh, you were sort of on the other side as, of Joe Jordan, who, in, in when they were talking about moving the school, you you favored moving the school to another location while he and others yeah. wanted to keep it there. And I was just wondering, what was your rationale for wanting to move it? Well, I think desegregation was what the law required. And uh, by moving it, you could get a new school. You could get uh, a school that blacks and whites would attend. And there were people who wanted to keep Booker T. Washington as it was, you know. And, he, he, you you had to provide for what the Constitution required, and I understood the feelings of people, but uh, you know the law is the law. 
Were you um, interested in in changing the tax base of that school? Was that part of? No, it was in order to get the school. See, at that point, uh, Norfolk was majority white. The schools were 58 percent white, 42 percent black. So there was no reason why we couldn't desegregate every school, which we ultimately did, including Booker T. Mm -hmm. But uh, I understood the feelings of blacks who wanted to, because I went to an all-black school, Bang Walker, and so I knew. But, you know, progress has to go on despite, despite these feelings that people have, pride.